So after we bought the uh, Dave Herensberger's Pay and Pack Racing Team in 1976, and uh, Bill was a national champion that year. He didn't win the Gold Cup, but he, but he drove the boat well, did well. All right, so now Jim Lasaro said, okay, Bill, now we're, we, I want to bring out the this hull that, that I'd built, and you know it needs a still needs a little work, need to finish it. And Bill knew it was a cab over, and he was just so apprehensive. Um, his experience had been with the Thriftway too, and uh, he described to someone once how it was to drive that. I, I guess though that it had it was a little bit longer, like 32, 33 feet long, and. So he got in it to drive one time, and he remembers he was going to turn, and he said, "Okay, now all together, now one, two, three, and and it was, and he got it around the corner, but it was so tough to get around the corner, and he was really nervous about doing that because uh, he said it was like uh, driving one of those trucks that are, uh, you know, flat. There's no hood at all. Uh, what is your feeling when you're out there on the front, as you explained to me yesterday? Tommy, that's a real difficult thing to answer. It's hard to explain it because I've been driving for 14 years the other way. But it's just um, like being completely engulfed in a fog. You haven't any sensation of speed, uh, with the exception of the wind. You can't hear the engine or anything like that. Um, all you're getting is instrument readings, and you know what your engine's doing, but you can't hear it. And you don't realize that you use sound to drive with so much until you're deprived of it. And uh, so as a result, I'm just, I just about have to learn to drive all over again, all new, because it's an entirely new concept. It's so, so completely removed from what we've been doing that uh, it's just hard to explain. One of the things that, that I discovered in, in uh, uh, viewing not only our boat, but a lot of other boats and, and what was going on with them is that, is that the boats, everybody thought the boats had too much air in them and, and that they were, they were real prone to flying. Well, what I found out was that was it was ex the exact opposite. No, they were they didn't have enough air, and they weren't flying enough, and, and uh, so they were uh, reacting off of the water, and then it, the boats would react up, and then they they look like they were flying. So uh, I, I had this harebrained scheme. Well, we we need to to make the boats wider, get more air under them, and, and uh, I got together with some Boeing people, and we we made some modifications in in the overall designs. Uh, I, I knew that we could build the boats lighter. We, you know, the, the, the 73 pan pack was the first honeycomb boat, and based on, on what I learned off of that boat, as well as watching some of the other boats that had tried to copy that, uh, I, I knew that we could, we could take advantage of, of some of the strengths of the honeycomb uh, and, and build the boats lighter and stronger. So we, we just started out with a clean sheet of paper and, and did everything different. No, that was the first boat that was really relied almost exclusively on bonding techniques to, to hold the boat together. And uh, there, there are actually very few mechanical fasteners in it. We did a tremendous amount of testing of structures and, and glue joints and, and different types of glues and, and how, the, how the whole thing was going to be assembled before we ever, ever uh, even cut a single part out. Uh, when Bill first drove the boat, and I, I knew he had a lot of trepidation about it, and, and I think it was, it was entirely justified. I mean, he didn't particularly like driving up front. He'd driven the Thriftway too, and he didn't feel comfortable doing that. And, and uh, uh, the, the feel for a boat is way different up front than it is in the back. I mean, in, in the back, you have a lot of visuals to, to work off of. In the front, you don't. And he, he was concerned about that. He wasn't sure that he could make that transition. And, and then, throw on top of that, we've got a fairly radical boat for its day. And uh, so he's got to not only learn how to drive up front, he's got to learn how to handle this thing. And, and I've got to try to help him get through this and get the boat to a point where, where it's, um, it's a raceable unit. And, and the first time we put it in the water, it wasn't. Uh, I think about 140, 145 miles an hour, we we're stretching the envelope right there. And, and uh, we kept making changes and making changes, and all the way through that season we made changes. But I, I, I remember commenting to somebody at that point, uh, in fact, we went to, to uh, Detroit and won there also, that if anyone else, I mean, anybody else, had been in that boat uh, for those first three races, 
not only would we not have won, uh, they probably would have crashed it, you know, because uh, it, it was a real handful. Uh, but the the boat didn't win those races because of the boat, uh, even though it, it was a fast boat, that it won because of Bill. Uh, nobody else could have handled that boat like he did. Obviously, we had a winning boat. It was a boat that simply dominated the hydroplane racing circuit for four years. In 1976, the boat won five races, finished second in two, and failed to finish only once. I had faith in the boat. I had faith that it could continue its winning ways in 1977, but I even had more faith in my crew chief, Jim Lucero. Jim had designed a brand new boat for Atlas Van Line to me. It's a cab over model, which means that the driver sits right up front ahead of the engine. For years, I, I had been one of the most vocal critics of the cab over design for hydroplanes. I honestly felt that a driver sitting in the bow would well, he just wouldn't have the control over his craft that he had driving in the stern. After almost 30 years of sitting behind the engine, I felt absolutely naked the first time I perched myself in the cockpit of the new design. And I'll have to admit, the first couple of times out in the new craft almost convinced me that I should maybe stay with the kind of boat that I was used to. But once I got my bearings straight, once I learned to master the Thunderboat and not let it master me, and once I could feel that the boat was an extension of me and I was comfortable with it and, and seemingly wearing it better and better, I became sold on the design and the possibilities of maybe, maybe even winning a race or two in it. So with one carefully thought out decision, I broke every rule in the book. I changed my horses in the middle of the stream. I, I withdrew my bet on a sure thing and, and played the long shot. It was the biggest gamble I'd ever taken. I still find it almost incredible that the first time this brand new sleek craft was placed in competitive waters, it powered its way to a first place finish. That was at the Champion Spark Plug Regatta in Miami. And before the season would end some four months later in San Diego, five more wins would belong to the Atlas Van Lines racing team. I think Bill, as I talked earlier about, hated change and this idea of you know, I think there's even probably, you can find recordings of him. One of his cliches was, you know, the guy sits in the front is the first guy to the accident. I'm never going to sit in front or something. Um, but he desperately needed something to pick up his career. And I think it was very, very difficult for him to do that psychologically, not physically. He was a great enough driver. You could have, you know, put the engine on the bottom of the boat and he, you know, he could have driven it. But psychologically, I think that was a big hurdle for him to get over, and I think it speaks highly to his career if you look at the eras he won in uh, and all the different kinds of hauls he won in, the different power you know, he won with. Um, he was a complete boat driver, no question. This boat, that the Blue Blaster boat that he was running was an extremely fast machine. It was extremely light. It was extremely delicate. And uh, through Jim's early efforts in running the boat, he got the thing detuned and settled down so that they could run it. But it still was an extremely light machine. Bill, winning the first two races seemed to be like, you know, nut soup. But uh, this is going to be a real treacherous course, and this is trouble. This is a tough. This is a tough race course. You know what? We ran all spring in Seattle, and we ran questionably. I was. I had great concern when I left Seattle for Miami for the first race. I wasn't sure that. You know, this boat could get the job done and that we could dial it in. And we didn't expect to win two races in a row. We're just mighty pleased that we enjoy that kind of performance. But I'm going to tell you, my guys, uh, they didn't win this race, uh, the race at the races. They won it the races two or three months ago when it was a, you know, a 15 to 20 hour day, day after day after day, seven days a week for a couple of months there. So we were just pleased with the, the way the boat's uh, progressing. And I think I'm driving it better, Jim. I don't think I'm driving it all that well yet. But I think I'm coming along. Does this cab over scare you? Yeah, it's a frightening thing. It's a whole new ball game. It's a new aura. It's a new atmosphere. It's something that I'm not familiar with. My timing isn't as good as it should be. I'm still muscling this boat around the race course. I'm not, it's not an artistic experience yet. But it will be by the time I get to Seattle Town. And let me tell you, when we get there, this sled's going to be running like a bandit. And along with another little surprise we've got maybe coming with our backup boat last year, uh, Channel 5 viewers, I think, are going to be pretty doggone excited about the two boats com coming out of this team and running for only all the money, marble, and chalk in, in Seattle.
Okay, Bill Muncy's got his work cut out for him here in the third race of the 1977 campaign, of course, on the treacherous Detroit River. Here on the Columbia River, it's Gold Cup 1977, the big one of the year. And I'm standing between two fast guys. I guess you could say I'm in fast company. Bill Muncy, defending 1976 champion, is trying to catch this guy, Mickey Riemann, who is leading in 1977 high points. And Bill, the Atlas Van Lines, you have some work cut out for you, trailing by oh, 673 I think, points. I think Mick is unbeatable. I just really think he's got a big edge on us from many points of view. His boat is just superbly prepared. It's been running like a bandit all summer. And I just don't know that, uh, I think we're running good and strong and we're going to get his attention, but whether we can catch him national high point wise or not, I don't know. I think that maybe the two of us will be winning some races together without question, but uh, whether we'll be able to catch him point wise, I think he's really got a hammer on us. Mickey Raymond, you going to take that? You think he's trying to psych you out? <laughs> Bill races on the water and he races off the water. We've been friends and racing together for a long time. You think about it this way, we're 673 points ahead of the Atlas Van Lines, that is the Budweiser is. There's 4,000 points left for grabs, so with 4,000 left, 673 is not a very big margin. We do not feel comfortable. We're working hard and the Budweiser crew is working and we're going to be running as strong as we can because it's a long ways yet. 1,600 points are up for grabs in Gold Cup 1977. The Atlas Van Lines and Miss Budweiser, top contenders in the 15 boat field. I think the Gold Cup in Bill's era held more prestige than it does to now. Cities actually competed to, to hold it. And I know it was the biggest thing to him. I mean, the championship, and I felt the same thing to a degree, that the championship was good, and that's what I was there to deliver for the sponsor. The Gold Cup I liked because it, it was high noon at 410. You bring your gun, I'm going to bring my gun, and we're going to settle this right here and now. Um, I like that aspect to it, and I think Bill liked that aspect to it, too. An unprecedented six gold cup victories for Bill Muncy. And if you know this amazing athlete, you know how much this victory means to him. Here he comes. It's official. What a day. Atlas Van Lines and Bill Muncy. An historic gold cup win today. It was just a, a great race because he made the best start, that flying start, with just all that boat speed and all the other boats came up to the line and, and then he just came shooting through them. And, uh, oh, it's just amazing. Oh, the Gold Cup? Oh, that was the, that was the supreme prize, I think, yeah. Because it was tradition, huh? You know, people, would like to come and talk to Bill Muncy. Those people, you could say, Bill Muncy was like that to Gar Wood. He wanted to go talk to Gar Wood, because Gar Wood was it, huh? And then after Bill got going, he was very, very successful. People wanted to talk to, to Bill Muncy. He's the, he's the Gar Wood of the new era. And uh, to, to win the Gold Cup, man, you were winning with guys of that caliber, you know? 
And yeah, can I win a million of them? Can I win all of them? Oh, I'd love it. I'd love it. You know? Sure. Not, not because it made him a giant, but because he did it. And he did it with that caliber of people. And here comes Bill Muncy. The checkered flag is out. The checkered flag is out. And there's your winner, Bill Muncy and the Atlas Van Lines winning this, the final winner take all Seafair Trophy race for 1977. I'm inclined to think that a lot of people have really enjoyed watching the Atlas Van Lines run this year because it's been a, an innovative machine. It's been a very exciting one. It hasn't been able to really uh, extend itself yet because the guy who drives it is just really getting to a point where, where he feels confident in it. And frankly, uh, to abuse the personal pronoun, I just got to say that it's going to take me a little more time to a point where I feel everything that's happening to me riding in the bow, it's kind of scary because you don't have any reference points. Sitting aft, you've got an engine that sits up there, you know, and if it gets out of shape or anything, you see the engine move and you can make the right direction. Sitting in the bow, you're deprived of that reference point. And with all that water passing under your stern so fast, it's pretty exciting. And you've got to measure the limits of the boat pretty well. But we've come down here to San Diego, and I think that uh, uh, certainly it's been able to establish one world record in, uh, for a qualifying lap of a little over 129. I'm inclined to think it probably could still, with a little help from Mother Nature, turn 130 or 31. And I think that it'll probably be run in the, in the race really well. Uh, whether there's a, a superstition associated with racing, I don't know. I'm not a superstitious guy. I do know, however, that San Diego is my home course, and uh, I haven't really been able to put together a win here. I've been certainly in contention, but I have uh, not been able to win here, and we're really looking forward to it. And it's the start of the big one. Atlas is in the outside lane, which is not where he usually likes to be. Mickey Raven is pulling ahead. So is natural light. What's the matter with Bill Muncy? The Atlas is slowing down. He's not going into the turn. Everybody has passed him. He has blown his engine. That can ruin your whole day. That looks like the end of the race, ladies and gentlemen, for Bill Muncy. Mickey Raymond takes a nice lead thanks to the gremlin in Bill Muncy's Rolls Royce. And Mickey Raymond and the Miss Budweiser wins the San Diego Cup and the Unlimited National Championship. A disappointed Bill Muncy has his Atlas towed on in to explain to an equally disappointed crew chief, Jim Lucero, that a Garfunkel pin let go when he poured the coal to it on the opening straightaway. Bill had never won in San Diego. Uh, and that, that, that was another thing that was like the, kind of like getting, like getting that sixth gold cup. You know, we really wanted to win in San Diego for Bill and uh, didn't, didn't get it done until the next year. And here's the start of Heat 1B. It's Muncy. On the outside, the Atlas Van Lines takes the lead right away. Going into the south turn. Okay, the best thing that happened uh, during the, the uh, first year of the Blue Blaster, um, I'd mentioned that uh, Bill always had a problem with Bill Newton, the, the referee. Well, now we had a boat. Once he gained the confidence of winning the first race, that wasn't really a test, but he went on and then he realized that this was the best boat that he'd ever driven, the fastest, the best, the easiest, the best handling. Then he realized that he, and so then he had fun with it, and so he would say, tell us, okay, I'm going to start in the uh, 12 lane or the 20 lane. I'm going to be out in the 20 lane so that he, uh, so he doesn't have to make a decision, and that's where I'm going to make my start. I'm not only going to be late for the start, I'm going to be out in the 20 lane, way away from the other boat, so he can't even, can't accuse me of anything. And so he would do that, and of course that uh, made Bill Newton mad too, because so they, he, uh, instituted some rule where they had to be closer to get, you know, they couldn't be out so far. But uh, he really had fun with it in the uh, first year anyway, because he was, he did, he knew that his equipment was superior, his hull and, and the engines were great, so he knew he could do it, and, and it was just so much fun for him. And I don't mind admitting that over the years I pushed the rule book right to its very limit, but of course that's what the rule book's there for. That's the reason why we have rules and to drive within those rules. That's part of the gamesmanship of it all. And I think that also represents a certain amount of confidence that you have when you come on like that, come on strong. And everybody is going to have a, you know, a problem playing catch up, and that's a good position to be in.
Hi there, I'm Bill Muncy. Over a period of many years, I've had the pleasure of associating with some of the most exciting innovations in the history of marine racing. Many have been masterpieces of design, each representing the next step, a new standard in the incredible growth of our sport. A new design is excitement. Brilliantly engineered and flawlessly manufactured, the BMW represents the ultimate personal driving experience. It's a magnificent and wise investment. It's a magnificent automobile. For the sheer delight of it, for the sheer brilliance of it, test drive a BMW, if for nothing other than reference purposes. Learn what the very best is all about. It's, it's just got to be one of the most exciting experiences of your life. Well, you just got to drive it to believe it. 